My guest tonight is an artist who created some of his greatest works on a half pipe and was recognized as one of the world's best when he was only a teenager. Anthony Frank Hawk would go on to become the most accomplished skateboarder the sport has ever seen, winning more contests than any skater alive, including 10 X Games gold medals. He's an inaugural member of the Skateboarding Hall of Fame and became the first person in skateboarding history to land the coveted 900. But before he became the face of skateboarding, did you know he earned his first sponsorship at the age of 12, bought his first house when he was in high school, and retired from competition twice before his 27th birthday? Tonight, we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is, a man who once said, I believe people should take pride in what they do, even if it is scorned or misunderstood by the public at large. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Birdman, Tony Hawk. Well, that's a nice welcome for well, Tony Hawk. Thank you very much. Learning your story, it is fascinating because it's it's much more than just the sport of skateboarding. I, I find your history unique. You're born in 1968, San Diego, California, youngest of four, yep. but the youngest by a long stretch. I mean, your next oldest sibling or nearest sibling is 12 years older. That's yep. it's an interesting way to grow up. I was uh, surprised, to say the least, to my parents. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my mom was 43, and at the time, that really wasn't considered safe even to right. have a child. She was, so, yeah. So your brother Steve's 12 <laughs> years older than uh -huh. you. You have a sister who's 18 years older, a sister who's 20 years older, yep. and, and there's a look at <laughs> yeah. all of it. Now, now you kind of joke about it, and I know it was a talked about open conversation about being a mistake. Did that bother you after a while? Uh, well, my mom always had a really good spin on everything, so it was like, oh, we were so delighted, and, and then she did have concerns because she was older, and she, she said, well, you know, it's either you're going to have these developmental issues or you're going to be a genius, and I think you went the other way. It was always like this healthy spin on whatever it was. <laughs> <Right>. Yeah, <clears throat> Like, you know, people thought I was a terror as a kid, and she said, well, he was just very determined. Right. <laughs> yeah. Determined is code for... Uh, impossible. Impossible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it was my way, and I was going to get what I wanted. And... It, it kind of drove you, in a way, into skateboarding, right? I mean, team sports, yeah. if you felt like you let your team down or you struck out at the end of a game, I mean, one time you ran into a gorge, and they yeah. had to basically talk you out. So at that point, team sports is kind of off the board for you. Yeah, well, I struck out my first time at bat, and I thought I was the ultimate failure. And I went and hid because I thought I let everyone down, and you know, and my dad was a, he was a little league coach, and so there was there was that added pressure, and I just was like I failed everyone, and I, you know it was hard for me to get into the I, I I appreciate team sports, but it was hard for me to get into the team spirit of that. Skateboarding was a way for for you to you found something in skateboarding, and I wonder long before it was even in your mind to make it your profession and to make money from it, and what was it about getting on that board that you identified with? I liked the freedom of it and the individuality. I liked, I liked those aspects of it, but more so, I liked the creativity. It was like, it was, it was like I found my, my instrument. I found my voice, and, and I could do these things with it that were uncharted, and, and a lot of it was, you know, it wasn't really appreciated. It wasn't like I was there doing it for crowds or, or for success. It was just more my own personal goals that I, that I made. And, and I was young enough that it wasn't like I was choosing a career. I guess that's the thing is, you know, people say, did you dream about all this? And what was about having, being rich or famous? You couldn't be rich or famous when I started skating. There was no end game in that. There was no end game. And, but I was so young that it didn't matter. And I found this community of, of like-minded people that were, that were into this you know, we loosely call it a sport, but this activity, and it fed into my, there's always different diagnoses through the eras, I guess, and so um, I probably would have been diagnosed with ADD, but then they called it hyperactivity, whatever it was, you know, I was right. very, I, I was very energetic. And so it fed into that energy and that instant gratification. You mentioned your dad, Frank. I mean, this, this is a, <clears throat> he's a great American. I mean, a, a highly decorated World War II, Korean War, Navy pilot. Mm -hmm. And somebody who, by the time you came along, because you are 
that much younger than your older siblings. It seemed like he had some time to really spend with you as, as, a, as a real hands-on dad. He did, but I, I think uh, he had a difficult childhood and he didn't have much support for anything he did from his parents. And so he wanted to overcompensate in that respect. And he did with all my siblings as well. So, you know, my, he would drive my brother to the crack of dawn to go surfing. My sister wanted to sing. He was like, he was the one carting all the band gear around. So he was really used to fostering whatever his kids were into. And when I came along, he would be the one that would drive everyone to practice at whatever skate park is having a competition coming up in Southern California. And he'd be like, all right, Wednesday, we're leaving, you know, at three o'clock after school and whoever's coming, pile in. And it was all the people from my local park that had no support system. And so he was already in that mode where it was like, I'm gonna support whatever he does, even if it's something different. And yeah, and I did was very different. I don't wanna pass by your mom at that age. Tell me about Nancy, who, who was a homemaker and somebody who obviously was extremely bright. Yeah, she well, she was an educator and uh, as well as a homemaker. And um, she was very supportive too. I mean, I got really lucky. My parents were, were helping me to uh, achieve my goals in skating because most of my friends had to hide their skateboarding from their parents and they were largely um, discouraged from doing it at all. And even when I went through a rash of injuries, I mean, I went through so many injuries that the doctor pulled me aside one day and said, you know, is there something you want to tell me? They thought you were getting beat up at, at home. home. They really did. They thought I was being abused, yeah. Because I, I had two concussions early on. I knocked out my teeth. I fractured my wrist. I, you know, and I was 11 or 12, and it was like, those aren't the kind of injuries that you would see on kids generally. But when you woke up from being knocked out, you wanted to get right back on the board. I did, yeah. Yeah, I was frustrated. I mean, if there's a yeah. better litmus test for yeah. somebody, is, is this really for him, or is this what he loves? That's it. I talked to your brother, Steve, and he said, what struck him, and again, he's 12 years older than you, when he'd be waiting to take you home from the skate park, yeah. He said, I could not get him to come to the car yeah. until he completed whatever he set his mind to do that day. He said, that I still mean, rings true. You can ask my wife. Really? Yeah. <laughs> at the age of 48, yeah, it, yeah. it still yes. rings true. But that's, yeah. that's how Steve knew, hey, th this kid's a little bit different uh, in, in the way that he's obsessed about this. I think I just set certain goals for myself, and I, and I did not, you know, it wasn't that I was trying to impress anyone else but I would visualize things that I thought I could do and I, and I had to see it through, you know, regardless of, of the journey or, or regardless of the, the abuse to my body. I think that was it. It was, it was that I didn't really, I didn't care about getting hurt if it was this for the sake of progression. Um, and, and I was willing to endure, even at an early age, I was willing to endure these injuries to make something happen, to figure it out. 10 years old, you find Oasis Skate Park? Yeah. Is that really where you took it to the next level or there was something that, that hooked you uh, in? I think that's where I fell in love with it. I skated because I enjoyed it and the, there was a communal aspect to it in my neighborhood. But once I went to Oasis and I literally saw people flying out of empty swimming pools, that was my wow moment. I was like, I wanna do that, I wanna fly. And I want to do it however, whatever it takes to get there, I want to make it happen. I got very lucky in that when Oasis closed down, my parents had actually purchased a house in North County, San Diego, and Del Mar Skate Ranch was pretty much the last skate park in California. And you were like five minutes away from it? Five minutes away from it, yeah. And that was not by design. I didn't feel like it was a lucky thing at the time, but through the years I realized how very lucky I was because that is really where I honed my skills. You know, that's, that's where I developed my signature style. That's where I developed a lot of techniques that um, were considered, well, they were considered lame at the time, but they were kind of groundbreaking when you look back at them. But, but that, that's interesting and that's really what I want to get into. So you're in your first real competition at the age of 11 and you're, you're so skinny that yeah. you're really not creating the inertia or some sort of force yeah. to do the kind of tricks right. that others were doing. So you had to kind of invent your own style. Yeah, it, it's hard to put in perspective with today's skating because there's so many different styles of skating. There's street skating, there's park, there's vert and whatnot. In those days, you either skated pools. There were no half pipes back then. It was just, it was all pool skating. Or you skated freestyle, which was basically you dancing around, you know, doing pirouettes and handstands and stuff. Freestylers were super lame. You know, that was like, that was, those were the nerds of the skateboard community. 
I don't know. I mean, we, we didn't outright uh, abolish them, but, but it was like, do you want to be cool or do you want to dance? Right. You know, and I want to be cool. I want to dance. I want to, yeah. Like, I want to be cool. I want to, and, and I want to fly, you know, and, and like freestyle was considered more safe and whatnot. So uh, obviously I chose vert or pool skating at the time. But with my pool skating, the guys that were established then were, were bigger, bulky dudes, and they were all about style and slashing, and I was just all scrawny limbs, and when I put my pads on, they would like go all the way to my hand and under my shoulder, and I would wear elbow pads as knee pads, and so I just looked like this weird alien freak with pads, but I... I figured out how to launch myself in the air because instead of sort of reaching down and using my strength to, to yank the board off, I used my inertia to, to lift off without grabbing the board and so it was actually airborne. And that is what is now considered ollie to grab, which is really the only way you see people skate now because if you saw people in the X Games reaching down for their board before they got to the lip, all their speed's gone. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so when I developed that, that's when I figured out how to do airs at the height that these established pros were doing it. And they all thought I was cheating. And I was like, you know, because they said, this Tony Hawk, like, he, he all these into his air, like, he could just grab it anyway, you know, after that. I was like, yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> and it was weird because I was an outcast because I skated, especially in school. So I was already an outcast to my peers. So then I find skateboarding where it's a very small industry, it's a very small interest in it. And my style was so different that I was an outcast within that strange outcast sport. So it was like, I've had haters since day one. I mean, you know, it's like, it, and I got used to that. And so I just got used to believing in what I do and believing that I, believing in it just because I love it, not because I believe in it, like, I'm gonna make a splash in the skateboard industry. It was just more like, I love doing this and I'm doing it my way because I don't really have a choice. Your first sponsorship comes at the age of 12 from Dogtown. Yeah. But Dogtown's kind of on its way Yeah, down. Dogtown is not the Dogtown that people, people remember of the Dogtown Z-Boys era. It was like the end of Dogtown as a company trying to survive and, and sponsoring new skaters. And as far as I knew, Dogtown was one of the best. You know, it was, it was the Z-Boys. Like, those guys were, were hugely in, influential. What's the end game even at this point? You know, you're the end game 12 is, years old. The end game is free gear. That's it. Yeah. So you're not free going, skateboards, yeah. Yeah, that's so that's yeah. all your mind was thinking about back then. Yeah, and 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 competing because that was the only way to get recognized. So, if you wanted to go, you know, if you wanted to go hang out with other skaters, you had to go to the competitions. It wasn't like you could put out a video on YouTube and be recognized. You know, it was more like you had to go where the action was, and the action was at the contests. There's a fascinating man who comes into your life named Stacy Peralta, who sees your determination even as a 12-year-old, yeah. and says, I want him with me, which becomes the Bones Brigade. It was starting, and then as I was included in it, it was already Mike McGill and Steve Cavallaro and Rodney Mullen. And now, now Rodney Mullen, this guy was doing things on a skateboard that just defies logic. Yeah, well, Rodney transcended freestyle, because like I said, our view of freestyle was, you know, the kind of nerdy guys doing pirouettes and dancing around, but Rodney was doing things that, that even we as, as these cool vert skaters were like, that is incredible, that is extremely difficult, and he is, he's creating something. When you would hear Rodney's name called, all of the skaters would, would go around the freestyle area to watch. And it was the only time there was a crowd on the freestyle area. But, but we knew what he was developing was something special, and he and I had, were kindred spirits because we were both breaking new ground without any direction. So I learned that trick from Rodney. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's what I sense. You guys are looking at each other and you're picking up. So that with the board is part of Rodney's freestyle. Yeah, I mean, that, well, that was the first time, that was like the first ever flip trick on vert. And I learned that trick from Rodney. It was a finger flip air. And uh, he, in turn, learned some of the tricks I was doing there, like the air walk where you take both feet off. He learned that on the flat ground. And so we were just bouncing ideas off each other because we really didn't have any other peers that we could do that with. And, and I, the team is so cool and unique because it's 
almost like the Dirty Dozen, right? I mean, everybody had their thing. Yeah, we didn't know what we were creating and what we were doing, but we were just stoked that, that um, collectively it was progressive and we were evolving tricks and evolving skateboarding and, um, and definitely feeding off each other. Uh, and, and it did, yeah, it became, you know, we were, the, we were the dream team at the time, especially coming up through the competitions. Like it was, you know, you'd see the results and it would be like first, second, third, and fourth were Bones Brigade members. So at age 12, you go in your first national competition and you end up in Jacksonville, Florida? Yeah. And that did not go well. No, I, I, when I look back at that, I, I feel like that was a really more of a learning lesson that Stacy was offering me as opposed to expecting me to go there and, and blow everyone away. I was considered really good at my home park, okay at, at some of the other parks because I was familiar with them, but to just be completely out of my element. And that was the first half pipe contest, actually. So we were all used to skating pools at the time, and they had a half pipe at, this, at Jacksonville. And so I went there and um, just I skated okay, you know, but, but fell a lot. I was super nervous. It was my first time out of state skating. And I think it taught me a lot in terms of learning to adapt my style and learning to believe in myself. Fast forward to Upland Pipeline was considered the, the gnarliest pool at the time. Like it was, it was steep, it was deep, it was rough. It, it was like, that, that was it. That was, that was wh where the, the pros get separated from the amateurs. Or, right. uh, and so, but I made it my mission to, to get confident there. And I won an event at Upland. And when I won the event at Upland, that's when everyone shut up. So all these doubters are shutting up, but I, yeah. I don't want to lose where, lose where you are in school. You're, you're getting into high school now, and, yeah. and the, where are you fitting in or not fitting in as you're a freshman in high school? Or a... It was odd. I mean, I, I would go to school and, and be pretty relatively unknown in the halls, and then I would go away for the weekend, like go to Jacksonville and win a big contest. And then and, you're a rock star on the, on the I road. I mean, I thought it was a rock star, but, it, you know, there's a couple hundred people watching. <laughs> All right. But, yeah, the, it's, it's just funny to think of this kid who's – setting the skateboarding world it, on it, fire and it back was a paradox school, for sure. it's like, yeah. you know, you're, you're disappearing behind a locker. So as skating started to get some popularity, people at school knew that a pro skater went to their school or that Tony Hawk went to their school, but they could not pick me out of a lineup. Wow. <laughs> and, and it's funny because at age 14, you just one day go to a contest and you basically check the box yeah. to say, I'm a pro. Right? Yeah, yeah, that was it, yeah. Which meant what? Which it, meant you were going to take money if, if you... Yeah, so in those days, you know, it was, it was amateur or pro were the divisions. <clears throat> um, the only thing that differentiated one from the other was that you were competing for money. So I'm filling out the entry form, and basically it is. It says pro, it says amateur or pro. And then I'm filling it out, and I, I looked at Stacy. I'm like, well, what do, what do I do? And he's like, hey, man, you... You know, it's whatever you want to do. I'm, I can't dictate your pro status. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm pro. That was it. Um, <laughs> so not like some huge ceremony. There was no ceremony. That was it. it was, there was more of a wave of like, oh, my God, I have to compete against the guys that spit on me. I really did. Literally those guys. They're... Yeah, that was it, because I had moved up into their category. And they were getting older, and I beat them. <laughs> yeah. I didn't spit on him, though. You didn't spit on him. It seemed like no. you always took the high road. I mean, you're talking about Dwayne Peters uh, in, in particular. Yeah, I, well, it, Dwayne Peters was, was a legendary skater, and it's super innovative in, in, in the late 70s, early 80s. And I did find myself skating with him at this park, and there was no one else around, and so I was really excited, like, it's Dwayne Peters. And so I kind of sidled up to him and was looking at him, and he was making a joke to his friend, and I started laughing, thinking I was, like, going to be buddies and... He looked over and spit on my skateboard, and he said, this is punk rock, kid. And I was like, oh, yeah. OK. And so that was my first contest. I ended up beating him, and that was sort of my coming of age. But you know, it wasn't like, but it wasn't, you know what I mean? It, didn't, it just felt, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't like vindictive like that. I just, it was, it was like, it was that time. 1983, your dad starts the NSA which is the National Skateboarding yeah. Association. And so now you've got this 
parent who's been there with you and driving you to all these things and says we need a like a body for skateboarding he starts this what tell me whose idea was it was that your idea was that something he came up with uh, how are you seen in competition after your dad has basically formed the governing body for skateboarding well the there was no governing body then and in all the the competition series had kind of dried up so every, there, were, there were sporadic events happening, but there was nothing cohesive. And my dad saw that and he said, you know, there, there is still this, a, a, a pretty serious skate scene and these people want to compete. They want to, you know, they want to have events. So he took it upon himself to, to organize a sanctioning body for events, basically. And, and in essence, he wasn't judging competitions, but the judges were answering to him, or he was selecting judges? Uh, he was just the organizer. I mean, he wasn't... And I, I guess I only bring that up, because I, if you're this outcast, now you're doing stuff oh, that absolutely. other people are doing. Oh, absolutely. There were definitely claims of favoritism across the board, yeah. But I can't say that my dad was like, hmm, you should judge, you should judge. Do you like my son? Okay, you can judge. Uh, no, it wasn't like that at all. But in this culture, that's kind of counterculture... Oh, absolutely, and, yeah. And you've was, got your, yeah. your parents hanging around, and your dad's involved. Is that kind of like... I'd say that was my second wave of haters. <laughs> but did it bother you? Forget the haters. Um, it bothered me. It made me want to distance myself from my parents in those scenarios, for sure. And, and, and it came to a head um, not long after that where I, you know, I kind of told him that I feel like there's a lot, so much scrutiny on me because you're here. And uh, he, he took it pretty badly. He, did, he couldn't empathize with it. He was like, he thought I was insulting him. But it did set a, a tone for him that he knew I was trying to really just be my own be my own entity, be my own skater. But there was still animosity between other skaters. Uh, and, and definitely when, I think when the finals, the NSA finals were held at Del Mar, that was sort of the moment where people were like, oh, of course the finals are at Del Mar. That's his home park. That's his home park, yeah. That, that was probably the hardest one for me to rise above. But you won it. You were the yeah. first world champion, NSA world champion. Yeah, but but then after that, I, I started getting better at the other parks, and and it was kind of like, okay. I shut up the, the haters. Now you're starting to gather momentum, and you're starting to make some money. The, the financial success happened very quickly. I I remember saving my, my competition earnings through the, like, the early years of being pro, say 14 to 16, and being so excited when I had enough to buy a moped. Like I had $500 in my account and I could go buy a moped and I could get my own, get myself to the skate park. Like that was the big deal for me. And then through ages 16 to 17, every month, like my, my uh, royalties were jumping um, double, triple, quadruple. And, and it was like all of a sudden I had substantial money. I know at the beginning, your first deck got you a royalty check of like 85 cents? Yes. There it is. Yeah, yeah. That's what a check for 85 cents looks like. <laughs> um, that, you know what's good about that is that it, it allowed me to understand how much I get per deck. Yeah. So I, I, that was one, that must have That's been one, one deck sold, yes. And then you go through kind of a redesign of the logo, your star grows, and now you're making three grand a month. Yeah, it happened very quickly, and so my dad, he was the one who said, you know, you might, you might want to consider investing some of this money that you're making. And they're building this whole new tract of houses right down the street. And he went down there and, and basically s reserved a house for us because he had to co-sign it. I was 17. You're 17 years old with your own house. Yeah. That is like every kid's dream. A bachelor pad before you even <laughs> were a bachelor. It was such a bad idea. Why? Okay, yeah. but did you, you slept there, lived there? Yeah, I had three roommates, and uh, it was just party time. I mean, it was ridiculous. Like, you know, it's you know, in those days, it was like, whose whose parents are out of town? It was like my parents were always out of town. Right. <laughs> at, at some point, you, do you take the high school proficiency exam? I did. I took it and I passed it. But by the time I got the results, I only had one more year of high school. It was unspoken, but I knew my parents really wanted me to get a high school diploma, a proper one. Um, and so I, I pushed through and. I graduated. Was college even a consideration at that point? It was. For you? Well, it, I mean, you're such a smart guy that I would think that there's some allure 
into going to the next well level. it was just more tradition too like all my my brother and my sisters had all gone to college my my mom was a college educator and so just to appease them i went and looked at a couple colleges you know walked around the campus like yep that's cool yep, right yep if i were you're like i could skate there and yeah. i could skate there <laughs> and i think one day i just finally said dad i have so many opportunities i mean i literally out of high school got um the the movie part for gleaming the cube like i was i was hired to do a movie based on my skating christian, christian slater, slater yeah movie. and so that was the moment where he kind of backed off because it was like i was i was just going full steam ahead and and i could tour more you know i could explore more possibilities more more opportunities in skating and and that's when he let me just go i'm wondering at this point in your life you've lived on your own now you have your high school degree what what are your goals? What are you hoping to get out of skateboarding? Is that going to be it? You know, your parents want you to take college courses in case there's a I, need to I, fall I back. I wasn't looking that far ahead. I was you 18. You didn't even think about that. Yeah, stuff. I mean, I was 18. I was making six figures a year. It seemed like I was invincible. It just seemed, you know, there was, I, I couldn't see an end to it. So it wasn't like I was like, all right, you know, just got to get to this point and then everything's great. It was like, what else is, what else can we do? This isn't, you know, it was like a dream. It was a dream come true, but something that we couldn't even have dreamt back then. But there was a point there where you got a little burned out or frustrated or... Um, I got jaded on competition around that time. Because people expected so much out of you? They just, well, they just expected me to win. And, and it was like, if I didn't win, then I sucked. And I didn't like that pressure. And um, it was hard. It was, I had to really do some soul searching then because I love skating. And there was no other way to make a living skating than by competing. It was all about competition. And I was at a point where I, I was falling out of love with competition because um, people put so much pressure on me. While your career is going and your high school life is happening, there seems to be this quest that's starting for you. And maybe you don't realize it at the time. But I know you were landing different tricks that kept testing you and testing you. And in 1985, you land a 720. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Oh, so this, yeah, this is the first one. That was it. See that big crowd? So that was just near some lake on the outskirts of Stockholm. That's crazy. <laughs> How shocked were you that you were able to land that in 1985? Uh, it's weird. It didn't seem that monumental at the time. 540s had just been created the, the year before that. So at that exact camp, because they had a bigger ramp, which gave you more airtime, and no one had really discovered that aspect of, of skating yet. So Mike McGill created the McTwist the year before. And then when I went there, I realized how much airtime I could get and that I could spin faster coming up backwards and just kind of did it, to, you know, to know... <laughs> no fanfare. There was no one there. It, was, it seemed kind of groundbreaking, but it didn't get a lot of coverage. It, because in those days, it was like, if you didn't do it in a competition, it, it, they didn't count it that much. So you try the 900, which is another, I'm no math major, but 720 plus 180 right. equals 900. So now right. you have another half. I, start, I tried it, I think it was maybe two year no it was the next year yeah after 86 that. yeah 86 i tried it uh we were at another skate camp in france with a big ramp like that but i couldn't i wasn't getting close i mean i tried but it wasn't gonna happen then so i know we've joked about it a little bit but when you're trying a 900 and you bail out of it that that was more dangerous for sure because on a 900 your back your back is turned to the landing zone twice so there's no way of really spotting where you're going to land besides just feeling it and hoping that you're in the right position to do it. When I started trying it, I didn't really have the right spin. I didn't really even have the right commitment. So when I first started trying it, I would end up on my back sliding down the ramp backwards going, where am I? How did I get here? This isn't going to work. Do you sense that it's possible? A couple years after that, there were a handful of us trying it. Danny Way, who is, who is a pioneer He came skater, the closest, right? He was on video actually putting his board down on the ramp, and, and they, they fade away at that point. And so there was this big you know, folklore, like, he made it, but the camera turned out. Like, come on, you know he didn't make it. But right. <laughs> he was close, and that's all, you know, that, that was the spark for me. That was like, oh, it, it actually is possible. 
So here's where we are in time. 85, you land the 720. 86, you've tried the first 900. 1987, SI for Kids calls you the Gretzky of skateboarding. <laughs> and now, tell me about the pressure that's mounting on you professionally. I started to uh, get disinterested in competition because of all the pressures of it and, and wanting to do something else, but realizing that it would be very hard to make a living. But so, so I did kind of distance myself from contests. I stopped entering them for a while. I found that, that my resonance was dwindling in the skate industry because I wasn't competing. You know, my name wasn't up there on the, on the rankings. And, and, so, and that's, so at the age of 19, you basically retire. Yeah, I mean, f f briefly, yes. And, and in my eyes, I, I needed to. I needed, I needed that just for my own peace of mind. Was but. it like a timeout or was <laughs> it I'm done? I never really made ultimatums like that. Um, I knew that I might have to come back to it if I wasn't able to make a living. You know, it was, it was becoming like, wait a second, this is, this is actually my career and I have to figure out how to make this last. Yeah, and you're supporting people and you have financial burden and the yeah. burden is dependent on you doing things like landing a 720 or maybe someday well, in land. Competition. In competition, <laughs> yeah. 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 It doesn't matter what you did right. outside of Stockholm. This, this is, you right. gotta do it now when all eyes are on yeah. you. That was the shift for me. That was the shift in, in terms of, I should just go enjoy this and maybe take some more chances. And if I do come through, like, I'll be so far ahead of what I was doing. For me, the motivation is just to, to do something new, to keep, to keep evolving. Street skating is now coming up. Yeah. And, and that's real counterculture. Like, hey, all you need is a, is a board and we can go do it on and steps yeah. and on a bench and whatever. And you're... You need ramps and you need skate parks and you need, so was, was what you were doing being looked down upon? It wasn't being looked down upon, it was just less available. The skate parks were all closing because liability issues. You know, it was, it was the 80s, everyone's suing everyone and <laughs> skate park was the perfect venue for that. And then people were taking, the ones who love skating were just taken to the streets because they realized that there is this urban landscape that is a skate park. Mark Gonzalez was the first one to use a handrail as a skate obstacle, and that opened up this entire world of uh, new types of skating. In 1991, <clears throat> you're making significantly less money. In 1991, my income was dropping by half every month. I mean, not just every year, like every month. Um, my royalties were, were being cut. I would get a call from one of my sponsors, like, oh yeah, we can only pay you half of what we were paying you. And I was thinking, well, that's going to be for this next year. And then two months later, well, we can't really afford that anymore. And it was like, it was rough. In the next year, you become a father. Yeah. For the first time. Yeah. And, and it coincides with the bottoming out of your yeah, money making absolutely. abilities. Yeah, that was, that was really difficult. Well, so in 91, I, I felt the sky falling in terms of being a pro vert skater or being a pro skater at all. And so I decided I wanted to stay in skateboarding. I love it too much and I'm going to shift my focus from being a, skate, a pro skater to being a company owner and started Birdhouse with uh, my partner, Perry, who was also a former pro skater. And initially, that was not a smashing success. No, well, no skate company was a smashing success at that time. Right. This is the great Tony Hawk and his Birdhouse <laughs> yeah. team are and, skating for 500 <clears throat> bucks as a group and, right. and skating parking lots. Yeah, and so whatever they would set up for us, that's, that's the demo. So it was like a curb you know, a little launch ramp kicker and, and whatnot. At any point, are you questioning no, life I, decisions was, at I, that point? I was too passionate about skating. I loved it too much. You know, it, it allowed me to skate. This, you know, I, I still get to ride my skateboard and it pays the bills. And, and now I'm fostering this new crew into their own careers. And, and I loved it. I really did. I loved it. This <laughs> isn't in that long. I mean, that's a 12 year stretch. That's not that long of a time. No, uh -uh. Um, it's like you lived three lifetimes <clears throat> in that right. 12 year stretch. Well, luckily, I had lived through the, the early days of skateboarding not being popular to know that it was cyclical. You know, even, even at my young age, thinking I was invincible and whatnot, I still knew that skateboarding came in and out of popularity. And so I was like, okay, we're riding this one out. But the ride was longer than I anticipated. And so, yeah, I was eating Taco Bell and Top Ramen for a good two years. So in 1995, the X Games come along. It seems like that's the ultimate corporate attachment for your sport. And I would think you guys would fight that tooth and nail. I was not of that mindset because I never was trying to covet skateboarding and keep it 
away from everyone. I, I always wondered why it wasn't popular. I didn't understand that, that what we were doing didn't appeal to kids at the time. And so for me, my expectation of the X Games was to promote skating because my name was one of the few that was recognized from the last wave of popularity. So as we came into the X Games, there was this sort of, this audience that may have already heard of me because of my success in, you know, the, in the late to mid 80s. So I, I had that advantage and ESPN took full advantage of that because they wanted to highlight me. And, and I had been competing a little bit right before that. So I'd won a couple of events before that. So I, when I came into the X Games, I was the favorite in all the skate events. They've been seeing this stuff on skateboard parks for years. Tony Hawk coming out of competition retirement less than two months ago. Places third doing all kinds of different tricks that skaters don't do, the McTwist, the varials. Oh, he missed on the varial. He's human. And there is your champion at the Extreme Games and your champion for all time in skateboarding, Tony Hawk. So there you go, your champ. <laughs> People like me who are doing the work at ESPN for the X Games dubbed you the Michael Jordan of skateboarding. Oh, yeah. What does that do, though, for your company? I mean, here's the Michael Jordan of skateboarding. You're the focus of the X Games in 1995 on ESPN. Now, all of a sudden, I would imagine Birdhouse is in a different position maybe the next day. It took a little while, but yeah, around 90s, around the second to third X Games is when suddenly we had a, a serious upturn of, of sales and interest and, and, uh, and we actually could justify our own salaries. <laughs> so now you're, you're at this juncture in your life. All the while, we've kind of left sitting over here a quest for the 900, right? I mean, yeah, th this, uh, is, this has become, by this point, something that you are fixated on making I, happen. I was actually, at that event, had, had gotten really close to doing it um, right before that. In fact, I think there was a, one of those runs where um, the, the announcer, he didn't really know skating that well, but he knew of that. And he said, oh, here, because I was already in first. He's like, I think he's going to try a 900. He's been trying it. And I didn't know he said that, but I wasn't right. going to try it there anyway because I knew it was going to. But it was in your mind. To it was always that. in my mind, yeah. Um, I had started getting... I started getting the spin better. I started getting closer to it. Uh, I really tried to do it in 1996 a number of times um, to the point where I committed fully to a couple of them and actually broke my rib um, on one. I'll never forget. I, this one day, with just the feeling was right, and I went to land it. I finally committed to putting my skateboard back on the ramp, and I was leaning too far forward, and I went straight into the flat on my shoulder and broke a rib right here, and I was late picking up Riley from preschool um, because I had broke my rib, but I couldn't go to the hospital. It just, that, that time frame kind of uh, sucked it away from me, and I was like, oh, I gotta go get my son from school, and it was like that sad thing where the teacher's waiting with him, he's the last kid in class, <laughs> and I come in, I can't really breathe because I've like slammed on 900. It was so, it was such a defining moment in terms of responsibility and um, uh, obsession. Let's take a look. We talk about these wipeouts. We all watching these. Let's watch the video. Oh, you got to play that one. Look at that. Oh, no. That's not me. That's not you. Oh man, that was that was the heaviest slam we've ever seen. That was so, me announcing that slam. That was me on the mic, yeah. And it, we put that at the end of it because that's those are the stakes, right? I mean, that's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's sitting back there sure. every time you jump on that board. Yeah, and and especially th that voice grows louder as you grow older and you get more responsibilities. And um, yeah, it's uh, it, you know it's it's a fine line, and um, but it's it is the risk we take, and and. Like, he got up to skate again and win the X Games after that. Uh, of all the things that happened to you in the good category of 1995 with the X Games and Birdhouse is starting to take off, you lose your father that year at the age of 72. Yeah, he, uh, um, he got lung cancer. He wasn't a smoker, but he got lung cancer. And uh, his health started declining really rapidly, in fact, during that X Games. 
um, but he got to see it. And I feel like there's some closure there for him because he championed skateboarding through the, through the 80s you know, to form the National Skateboard Association. He saw it you know, reach a certain level of popularity and then die very suddenly and very drastically. For him to see skateboarding on ESPN was a huge moment. And I think, you know, he obviously he didn't get to see how big it actually could get. But for him, there was a sense of full circle and, and recognition and validation that he was striving for, for skateboarding, not just for me, but for, for skateboarding, because he saw what a positive effect it had on me. What a gift, this, this man. I mean, who knows if you're sitting here as Tony Hawk, if not for his... Oh, yeah, driving could, you around and his support. No, absolutely. I mean, his support was it was, it was definitely one of the reasons I'm here. Um, and I'm I, and, and like I said, he never got to see how truly big it it became or how much potential it had. But the fact that he saw it on that platform on national TV was a big deal. In 1998, your company Birdhouse plans this video and Mex you're in Mexico and Tijuana yeah. mm -hmm. um, and you're really there in essence after a pretty big layout financially to do the 900. We had one of the, the best teams at the time um, in 1997-98 in Birdhouse and we wanted to make a cohesive video of our team um, so I designed what I thought would be sort of the ultimate ramp all along knowing this could be the ramp to do a 900 on because it's bigger and and that'll probably be the crescendo of the video is me finally doing 900. So that was always the unspoken finale of the video. The guy who was making the video, his, his creative idea was like, you're a bullfighter and th this ramp is your bull and let's do it in a bull ring. And so the second to the last day was the loop day. Cause I hadn't done that and that, that's a big risk factor as you saw with the, my big slam there. Went down there, figured it out, did the loop. And it was like, we have one more day to shoot. The whole team comes down for that day. No one's saying anything. But the whole vibe is Tony's going to do 900. Right. This is like a pitcher with a no-hitter where nobody wants to talk <laughs> to him in the dugout. Nobody wants to get in your way. But yeah, it's but understood. Yeah, but like I've been there mostly alone for the last four days shooting all this other stuff, you know, and tricks that I'd never done before. A barrel 720 I'd never made before. Um, other tricks at bigger heights. You know, it was like, it was, it, for me, it was like a lot of, it was a lot of milestones. But it was always like, but you're going to do 900. And then we got down there and then I started trying them. But in the back of my head, the last time I tried to make it, I broke my rib. And I kind of got away lucky the way that I fell. And I was like, I don't want to be stuck in Tijuana with a broken rib or concussion or whatever. Or and worse. I could not, I couldn't get that out of my head. So you just said, no, we're not doing it. After like almost an hour of attempts, I just said, I, I can't do it, you guys. I can't do it. I'll never forget one of the, well, my partner at the time came over to me and he's like, well, I guess the bull won. And I was like, oh. Oh, dude, like, like here's harsh. the board. Go ahead. You do it. Jeez. OK, so you leave there and knowing you the little I do, I would imagine that little five year old voice was barking in your <clears throat> head going, uh, you just let everybody down. In my eyes, if I couldn't do it for the birdhouse video, I just can't do it. You know, it was like there's no other bigger incentive for me. Than, than to do it for your company. Do it for the company and do it on a ramp that I personally designed that's bigger than anything that's ever been built. It was like, that was it. And so um, that was kind of it. That was, I, I didn't really try it much after that. And then um, fast forward to the X Games in 99, which was about a year and a half later, uh, they had a best trick contest, which was the first time they had a best trick event in the X Games. So as the best trick contest came around, the only thing I had planned was a varial 720, which I actually actually had done for the Birdhouse video. So I knew it was possible. I knew I could do it. I made the varial 720 kind of midway through the event. And so for me, it was like, well, what's next? What's next is a 900. I, I, I'll, just, well, I'll just do it for the crowd. Like, I'll just, I'll just try some. For the, it was really like, well, here's what it would look like if it ever happened. But as I was spinning it, I started getting, you know, I started getting consistent with my spin and I started seeing my landing and that was, that was the key where I was like, I can see my landing almost every time. If it's going to happen, it can happen right now. And I, I shifted my weight to, to compensate for the, the fall I took the first time that I tried to make it and that was the key. Seeing my landing, shifting my weight, you know, the time had run out, I didn't care. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even expect it to be on TV. I just wanted to make it. Everybody picture it. Here we go. Feel it. Yeah, 
It's unbelievable. I mean, that, that look on your face is priceless. I mean, that's just sheer shock, joy, whatever you want to put to it, a combination of all those things. But can, can you even put into words what that feels like? Uh, it, for me, it was just a great sense of relief. I mean, if you, you like compare that scenario with the first 720 scenario, for me, it was the same motivation. It wasn't about the crowd. It wasn't about the TV. It was like, I just want to make this new trick. So it could have been on a backyard ramp outside of Stockholm, Sweden. But the fact that it was in that venue, you know, on that stage, and, and the, it, it resonated so far beyond anything I would have ever dreamed. I mean, that was the, that was the first skate highlight on SportsCenter. And, and f you know, as far as I'm concerned, that was like the biggest thing you could do in sports is to get a highlight on SportsCenter, right? Is it too sappy by me to equate you landing the 900 in 1999 to you being pulled off your skateboard by your brother 12 years older than you when no, you were it's eight? The it's the same motivation. It's the same, it's the same feeling for me, the same like dedication and discipline and, um, and quest that it was even when, you know, when my brother pulled me off of wanting to learn frontside rocks, whatever it was. So you retire from competition for good. I retired from, from vert contests, yeah. But you continue to try the 900. I, you know what? My skating um, improved so much more after that that it was, it was really hard to accept that retirement uh, label because I said, yeah, I'm not going to compete anymore, mostly because I wanted to explore other opportunities. And that allowed me this freedom of creativity to learn all kinds of new tricks and techniques and stuff like that. But in the mainstream view of what sports are, they hear retired, and it's like, you're, you've finished doing it. I'm not competing. I'm retired. OK, I guess you're not really looking elsewhere then, because I'm all over the place doing other stuff. Let's refer to this quote. I believe that people should take pride in what they do even if it is scorned or misunderstood by the public at large. I mean, this, this yeah, is the- And if it's positive. I'm not like condoning. Right, right. <laughs> but I mean, this is, this is the very essence of your life, this quote. What I learned from my dad was to believe in yourself, you know, do, do what you really love. Because if you're doing what you love, especially if you're doing what you love for a living, you're gonna be happy. You're gonna love going to work. And if it doesn't have the biggest financial success, who cares, because you're gonna do what you love. Well, now you think about where skateboarding has progressed, and, and we're talking about now an Olympic sport going forward. That, right. That's got to give you such a sense of pride, knowing that, that this sport that went through all these ups and downs, and you went up and down with it, that now this is something that's regarded as, you know, worthy of, of being in an Olympic Games. We've come so far in skateboarding, and I've seen it grow so much, but I also have this sense that it's about time. You know, like, look how, look how popular skateboarding is, especially compared to a lot of summer Olympic sports. I don't want to discount what they're doing, but really, the number of participants, the excitement level, just isn't there for, for their summer games. It's there for their winter games. Why? Snowboarding, right? Because they finally discovered, oh, that gives us a youthful edge. Like, these kids really into snowboarding. And I was like, yeah, you could have the same thing with, your, with summer games. And so all along i've kind of said i think that at this point the olympics needs skateboarding more than skateboarding needs the olympics would tony hawk be an olympic skateboarder no but i'm happy to do commentary unless i just blew my chance with that comment yeah no <clears throat> no but i've always said that no i mean and i really i'm not i'm not against it you know what i mean i i feel like if if the right people are are governing or are sanctioning the the competition aspect of it if, if the actual skateboard industry is involved in that process it could be a great thing and on on the flip side of that it would be amazing exposure internationally so you know there there would be an ethiopian skate team you know what i'm saying like yeah. that's amazing to me so for that that's the silver lining of the Olympics to me, is that, is that it, would, it would grow skateboarding in the most unlikely places. Are you still dreaming of tricks? And if, if the goal was at one time the 540, <laughs> then it was the 720, and then it was the 900. 1080 has been done. I'm not, I'm not chasing that one. 1080's been done. Yeah. Is this, where does this end? Where, um, where do well, we go? I, would, I would probably tone down the spinning a bit as I, reach, as I approach 50. Uh, <laughs> But there's still tricks I want to do. I mean, we're making a whole new video for our team, Birdhouse, right now, and I'm, I'm working on a whole bunch of new tricks, and I actually have some in the bank already. You know, I'm going to get a new video part by the time I'm 49, so.
I don't know, I guess let's just keep going until the wheels fall off. Literally, yeah. <laughs> you know, we end this show by saying, what's next? I mean, you've been able to grow this <clears throat> sport. What is next <clears throat> for you? Um, well, uh, so I, I started a foundation uh, almost 15 years ago for public skate parks in low-income areas. And, you know, we've really learned how to be effective in the U.S., how to support communities that want to help themselves, how to guide them through getting a skate park in the area. And, and so with that, we've, we've had a lot of success. Um, we've given away almost $6 million now. We've helped to develop over 500 skate parks in the U.S. But I've always felt like there's an international aspect to that missing. You know, how can we support projects in other countries? For us to do that by ourselves would be extremely difficult because we don't have the resources, we don't have the funding, but we've been able to do that through Skatistan. And Skatistan is, is a group that started a skate project in Kabul, Af Afghanistan, where this guy, Ollie, his name is Ollie. Come on. It really is. Ollie was there a long time ago with his girlfriend, and he started skating these empty fountains in Kabul just on the weekends, and suddenly these kids started flocking to him every weekend to try it because they were so fascinated by it. And he just started his own skate project there, um, and it's grown, ten it's grown huge. They, they actually have their own, their own um, facility. They have a school element to it, an educational element. Wow. And it is the only co-ed sport in Afghanistan. They consider it an activity. So you can get around it. So you can get way. around it. They've used that model, and they put one in Cambodia. Um, and we recently just funded their, their uh, project in South Africa. So that is our international outreach program, is Skatistan, and their plug and play model of skate park slash school. And I'm so proud of it because it is this progressive idea that they're getting just as many girls skating as boys. As boys. I mean, that's, that's more progressive than the US. That's great. Um, we end this uh, with, with fun questions. Which you didn't sign up for, but that's tough. Because none of that stuff was fun. Right, exactly. <laughs> Would you rather have x-ray vision or bionic hearing? Oh, wow, bionic hearing, so I can hear what my kids are up to in the other room. <laughs> Brilliant. Would you rather be able to read minds or send your thoughts to someone else? Uh, I feel like I've been kind of an introvert through my life, so I'd rather send my thoughts to someone else because sometimes it's hard for me to actually convey what I'm thinking especially to my family. Would you rather fight a Teletubby or E.T.? <laughs> Teletubby, without question. Would you I go would for Poe, Dipsy, ass. Lala, Tinky? Any of them, line them up. Yeah. I'd like to hit those things. Right in the TV stomach. Right, yeah, in the yeah. TV stomach. Yeah. That was the freakiest freaking show that ever came along, the Teletubbies. Well, here was my beef with Teletubbies when I was, as, as a young uh, parent. These guys were, uh, they were just a mess. You know what I mean? They would just be like, oh, Knock no. stuff over, yeah. Like, oh, no. And then they would walk away and they're like, and the new new tidied up. Right. And then this vacuum would come up and the clean, and I was like, what, what is that teaching anyone? <laughs> like, okay, so your parents are the new new. Right. Awesome, why don't you just spray slime Silly all over the house new -new. and we're good. Um, obviously, who we have sitting here is somebody who was glued to a skateboard early but was determined to make himself deliver these tricks that he would create in his mind, and I think revolutionized the sport, helped uh, for oh, its legitimacy, you. and really has become a great ambassador, not just for the sport of skateboarding, but I think for American sports in general. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Thank undeniable you. Tony Hawk. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, man.